Welcome to the Minimalist CEO Podcast with Nate Lindquist. Nate created the Minimalist CEO Method to help business owners redefine and grow their businesses by finding new demand in places they never thought to look where there's no competition. By following his opposite thinking strategy, Nate's coaching clients have grown their business up to 40% in just two months and created tens of millions of dollars in revenue. Nate himself has launched more than 140 businesses. On the show, Nate interviews successful business owners and experts who share the secrets you can use to have a better business and a better life. Hey everyone, Nate Lindquist here with the Minimalist CEO Podcast. And as always, I'm excited that you're here. Thanks for taking the time to reconnect. And we have good news for you today at this episode. We've actually got a lot of requests and not only from our team, but from those of you who have already heard the last podcast and are excited to learn more from our guest. So uh, Rich Witten is the CEO of Reconstruction Experts. They built their business up over $125 million a year. He came in and grabbed the reins playing several other C-level roles. Now he's CEO, he's running the show. Rich, thanks for making the commitment to come back on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me back. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, that's, it's good. And I think, you know, we had this feeling right after we we're done, we talked about it, like, oh, I would have loved to go deeper on this. And we talked a lot about culture. We talked about growing a business. You guys are in the rebuild space and obviously deal with, you know, when people have to, you know, they have a problem with their commercial residential property, maybe just for a second. I and mean, obviously we're looking to go deep here, talk about scaling. How did that happen? Major problems. But if you could just take a second and just introduce maybe from the perspective of, what does your business do? A little bit about who you guys are. And then I, I do hope to go in the direction of the secret sauce. Absolutely. But we could start with that, Rich. That'd be cool. And um, yeah, take it from there. So reconstruction experts, uh, we are involved in doing reconstruction of Occupy properties that are in distress, as we say. They're in distress generally for one of three reasons. They were built wrong to begin with something happened to them, either man-made or mother nature or, or something along those lines, or it's just aging and in need of upgrade or, or uh, refurbishment or remodel. And so really we think of those as our three primary end markets. We don't do any new construction. We focus really primarily on uh, multifamily residential and, some, and also some commercial uh, doing full scope. So all scopes get brought to bear from roofing, through building envelope, through interiors, all the way down to civil grading and drainage. So there's nothing that we don't do. So that's a little bit about who RE is, a real quick snapshot of, of what we are. So, I mean, just hearing that and thinking back again to the last, last interview we did in the podcast, it's got to be tough to be anything short of totally transparent in the work you're doing. You said these properties are occupied and you're getting the job done. You're under the pressure and the duress of tenants, owners, People, visitors, customers of the, in the property, all wanting to have the experience that they want. They don't know what you're doing in this property. How in the heck have you been able to navigate, you know, having everyone up in your business while you're doing your work? Well, you've hit it right on the nail, right on the head, Nate, is it's incredibly hard because you don't have one client. You have up to three or 400 clients watching your every move every day and how you're facilitating access and how you're facilitating all the safety protocols that are different in that environment and how you're communicating. And, and for me, communication is the real key, right? Is we've got to, over, you cannot over communicate. You've got to make sure that you're reaching out and letting everybody know what's about to happen every step along the way before it happens and managing their expectations. And that is, that takes an incredible effort and it takes the right mindset of your employees. And, and so our employees are very incredible at doing it, and, uh, and and we're super thankful for that. They're really something we we select for in the interviewing processes. So there's got to be, you know, you're talking about interviewing. You're talking about you know 400 plus customers. You're also talking about you know the people coming through the property who just all they want is to be happy and comfortable and don't want to be interrupted walking through the hall. You know, what's this sawdust? I mean, who knows what what they're dealing with. What kind of a mindset twist has to happen to, first of all, make your, you know, not just make, but, but train and hire and navigate to the culture of being, being able to tolerate and even work with that kind of a situation? Yeah, you've really got to find people who are very client service focused and oriented and, and have the ability to put themselves in the client's or the, or the, uh, the occupant's shoes. 
right? Think about things from their perspective. And what would you want to know as this, you know, root canal of construction is going on inside their, you know, their, their home. And so if you start thinking about and training your people that way, and then you're building all your protocols around that and making sure that everybody's sort of following the same recipe for communication, that's where you start to be able to, you know, have success and make sure that you're touching all the touch points. And then there's a, there's a constant check-in, even from the sales side, even when something's in production, our sales team never really leaves it. There's a constant check-in for those folks to make sure, is it going okay? Or is it meeting your expectations? So it's this one long running, uh, making sure that we're taking the temperature of the client the whole way through. Wow. And I think about so many businesses who they don't have a client appreciation program. They don't have a sort of a net promoter that, you know, constant asking for feedback process. And yet you're in the business where that's your product. I mean, a lot of ways you have no product without that. Would that be right? That's absolutely true. I mean, it is our primary differentiator. It's it's what we like to think, you know, helps to separate us a little bit from from some of the, you know, smaller competitors even. And and we've had great competitors in most of our markets who are who are good. But what's hard is really getting in there and sort of grabbing the reins at the very front end of the process, managing all of the planning, managing all of the communication showing creativity and how we're going to do things, showing how much we care to that client about their project, and then running a hopefully seamless execution process that doesn't have too many bumps in it. And so that's really what we're trying to accomplish when we get into these engagements. So one of the, the big things that you're talking about here with regard to you know, setting expectations, you know, and we talk to our clients a lot about is uh, scenario planning. You know, that word anticipation comes to mind. The idea of what is the ideal client experience? What is the ideal business experience? And then training for people to execute and deliver on a particular skill set, a service, you know, bring a product into someone's environment versus the, what's this experience going to be like for them? What's the experience going to look like for us? So first of all, I'm just really curious, when are you writing the book? (laughs) Because I, I think it's sort of, you know, the number of times I hear business owners saying, I don't have time to do a, a forecast. I don't have time to anticipate what someone's going to do. And they don't even look in the rearview mirror or they don't even look back at what did we have to learn? What, what's the tough feedback we got that allows us to change? So I'm, I'm throwing a lot at you here, but my mind's spinning. What would you say to those business owners who don't have the ability or haven't taken the time to anticipate scenarios? Uh, what I would say is we were you. We honestly, I'd love to just pat our management team on the back and say, oh yeah, we had this right the whole way. We made, not only did we make mistakes, we made colossal mistakes along the way. I think the important thing for us is we turned into those mistakes, really tried to understand the root of them and really tried to improve from that. And that really made a lot of the difference for us. And so we spent, you know, after we've made some of these mistakes where we were getting it wrong in multiple markets, we weren't doing things the same way. We weren't selling the same way. We were so reliant on purely talent who had you know, no training program or anything like that. We understood we had to break it all the way back down. We actually had to slow our business down so that we could put all of those things in place. And it took time to be able to script Here's what a, a, a good sales process looks like. Here's what a good execution system looks like. And now we want to train everybody on those things so that we're doing it the same way. We can monitor how we're doing based on those things. And we can then scale from there. So, you know, what I would say to answer your question to everybody is it's an incredible amount of work, but it's absolutely worth it because you won't get where you want to go if you're only relying on hopefully people can do it well. If if you're the architect you have to be able to share your blueprint or it's not going to be able to grow. Interesting. Share your blueprint. And people throw that term blueprint around so much. I'm actually taking notes here. I dig what you're saying. And I like, I love it. You know, for me, I believe like it's better to be the model than to be the business. If you can really master the model, you can apply it to any business. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a major mindset shift. So being the architect and, and being able to share your blueprint I think has helped a lot of businesses, at least the ones we've, we've worked with. We've watched them go from, Hey, I've got, I've got a lot of finesse, you know, I've got to wait. No, I'll, I'll, I'll handle this. I'm the one who's got the, 
I am the special sauce. Yes. Yeah, you're exactly right. And, and I think what's nice is I am not the architect. Um, we have really talented people in our management team who, who are the architects of here's the best way we know of how to sell. Here's the best way we know of, of how to execute. And what was really hard is they didn't even know how to describe what they did until we sat down and we went through, okay, it's almost like this huge flow chart of when this happens, what did you do? And then this, and you encountered this challenge and now what? And on the operational side. So what, when you think about safety and quality and schedule, what are the things that you put in place to ensure all those things are going to happen? We had to literally like have an author sit down with them and write their book for them uh, and then refine it from there. And it took time, but that was what really turned the corner for our company. That's what really made the big difference because now we could bring people into an environment where we had something to train them on. We want you to do it this way, not just figure it out, mm -hmm. do it this way. And now we have, then we built monitoring systems on top of that. So we could see whether they were doing it that way. And we built forecast systems to see what was coming. And so all these things that built upon simply having everybody speak in the same language really did make the difference in, in our company. So you had a do it this way process, then you have a monitoring it. What was the last piece that you just said? So, and then the last place is, is really a, a forecast system to see, forecast. okay, let's make sure that we can see what's coming ahead of us. And let's make sure we can balance our ability to execute with what's in front of us. And now, is sure that, that wrestle? Sync. I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't. Uh, and just that. make sure that stays in sync. Okay. So are you talking, we're looking at like serious cases of like, what could happen? Downside mitigation. What, what, what's likely that someone's going to be feeling while this is happening? And likewise, all the way through the processes at the granular level of, you know, if you have to be able to tell this, you said, write the story of what you do. Mm -hmm. So being able to write it like a book. Yeah. Like a process that can be followed, that somebody can pick up. It's a how-to manual. Somebody can pick up and follow it for the most part, and we can train them on how to do it better. And I think the other piece is staying humble that, there's even better and better ways of doing that. So be open to changing it and adjusting it and improving upon it. Um, because if you're just set, set in one way, you're going to get left behind in, in, in not too long of a period of time. And so even though we've got talented people who really understood how to do these things, we also had to make sure that we were humble enough to take input to be able to improve upon what we were doing. Okay. So We've hit a lot of topics here. <laughs> if we were to jump back to the secret sauce, it sounds to me like the secret sauce is you're in a business that has to have essentially every human that touches your project in, you know, it's the customers, it's the tenants, it's their customers, customers, it's the people who are living in a property or in their unit. It's the, you know, everyone who's interacting from the management team all the way through to the person who either owns the property or rents it or otherwise, those are all your customers. Yep. They're all going to have an experience. So you've engineered your business over time by making tons of mistakes. Your special sauce is very carefully anticipating, planning ahead and anticipating how to make that experience the absolute best that you can make it for them while also creating the outcome of the rebuild. Precisely. So spending so much more time at the front end than, than I think most people in our industry feel like they need to or should and walking everybody through every step of that process. And so we, we think of it as our, our three C's, which are more care, think about it from the viewpoint of the client, more creativity. Are there ways that we can do this that are gonna be less impactful to the community and, and hopefully save the client money, a different way of, of maybe you know, uh, deploying what the, the repairs need to be? And then more communication, because as we kind of talked about at the outset, the more you keep people informed and aware of what's about to happen, the less surprise they become, the less, you know, the, the more our ability to just continue down the, the path. So that third piece is uh, better communication. Is that right? Yeah, it's more communication. Yep. Communication. Okay. Interesting. All right. So that's your special sauce. And now um, I'm going to jump over and say, okay, you had to go from 30 million to you. You've guys have busted through what? 125 million now at this yeah. point. Through over okay. So if you, if, if you had to put it in a couple sentences, what had to change to jump from third? Well, actually, you know what? I'd love to do it in three pieces. Sure. I, in your experience and having been, you've obviously been involved along the journey and you've seen this, you don't get to the place that you're in. 
without seeing the, the, the ugly side and the winning side of this. You want to get to 5 million. You want to get to 30 million or maybe 15 million. You want to get to 30. Now you want to get to 125. Maybe we're jumping too far. How does that happen? What has to change? Yeah, I, I think the first few steps are, you know, there's a lot of really talented entrepreneurs out there who are making it happen and they're making it happen themselves or they have a very small group making it happen. And what they what has to change is they have to change from being these really talented you know, business people who are out there touching the client and, 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 and delivering the service and the value to now building out an organization that can also do that. And so that's how you start to get to these various milestones. You have to perfect what your differentiators and your, and your value proposition are. And then you have to be able to replicate that in others. Um, and that's really five, you know, to 15 to 30. 30 forward is now I have to become much more uh, systematic about what I do. I still need talent, but I need to profile what talent I need based on what are my what are my value drivers? What are my differentiators? And so if I'm selecting for those things and I'm bringing that talent in, now I'm able to train, as we talked about, train that talent in our system and process and be able to do that anywhere the same way all over, all uh, the McDonald's you know, style. Okay. There are some small nuanced differences from market to market, but by and large, we want to have a commonality to what we're doing across our entire platform. So and, and believe me, like I said, we made a lot of mistakes to get where we are and we've got a long way to go still, but, um, but it's working and it's been working for us. So we've, we've been really happy with the progress. Okay. So I see some of those top mistakes that have sort of peaked out during your explanation and just having a snapshot of like, wow, this company's gotten over 125 million. I want to hear where they crashed and screwed up. If I were to guess, I would say earlier in the game, there was a heavy reliance on individual talent based on what you shared. Maybe also the processes weren't constantly improving as well as they could be. And you weren't anticipating some of the problems interfacing with this massive collection of quote unquote customers. Were those some three, three of the big mistakes that you were making? Very true. Concentrated in a few talented people as to our value proposition and what we were delivering a severe lack of system and process so that we could talk about how we wanted to do it in any market or in, on any engagement. And then I think the, the third thing that you hit upon is, yeah, I mean, we, we were unable to really scale because of that. And we weren't balancing like what we did in the marketplace really resonated. And so we were selling, 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 and then we had the mantra of, well, sell it and we'll figure out how to do it later. Well, guess what happens? Uh, you're going to fail on execution and we failed a bunch on execution. So we had to create a system where we could balance capacity with what we were selling. And in order to do that, we had to know what we were going to sell in the future. And so we had to build systems around that. But yes, all three fronts, um, we outsold our ability to execute at one point and had some colossal project failures at one point. And that really led us to take a good hard look about what we needed to do to change that and what information we needed to get to be able to not find ourselves in that position again. Okay. So did you guys look to consultants, mentors, other company owners? Yeah, I think, you know, we did a lot of case studies, right? We, we went out there and we, we talked to uh, similarly situated companies in the construction industry who had faced this kind of thing before. And and I think, you know, we sort of already knew, but got lazy about the need to really forecast our business. And, and one of the things that came back and to me consistently as I was trying to do this is, well, we don't know what we're going to sell. Well, but we've got to, <laughs> you know, we've got to create our pipeline. We've got to actually manage our pipeline of opportunities and we're going to select and we're going to say, this is what our future is going to look like. And we know it's going to be wrong, but it's going to be closer than what we're doing today because today we're not doing anything. Right. So once you start, right, that's the biggest part. Get over the inertia, start your forecast. It's not going to be right. It never is, but it's going to give you an idea of what's going to be coming. And as you get better at it and better at it, it will become way more accurate and it will inform what your capacity needs to be. 
So you get and to start, you start to see things to look for, right? You, you absolutely, right? You you know certain things are going to push. You know some things can pull in, and you can run this baseline capacity, and you're flexing off that baseline either up or down instead of just a huge question mark and everything's a surprise. Every sale's a new surprise to your execution function. That's not the environment you want to find yourself in. Okay. All right. This is great stuff. So one thing I wanted to do that I think would be fun, and if you like the idea of it, then we'll do it. You could say, oh, you know, I'll just attack one. But what if I were to share, we get a lot of messages at Minimalist CEO from business owners who don't have the processes in place. They don't know what button to push. They're getting pulled in too many directions. Mm -hmm. And they have, they have a lot of, so I'd like to share the top issues that people are calling our firm with. And again, it's, you know, it's like, hey, is this Interspire? <laughs> yeah, we heard about the minimal CEO program. What, what should we be doing? We're in real trouble. And there's either a getting to stability issue. Mm -hmm. There's a, uh, you know, the selling functions inconsistent. There's details falling through the cracks. So if I could just go through maybe five of the top issues, Rich, with you and have you say, what would you do with each. And then if we were to give someone say like, listen, over the next say two weeks to 30 days, you have to put some draft pieces in place so you can work on the engine, but the plane's going to fly better. So there's some things, just do this stuff over the next couple of weeks, get this. Would you be willing to chat, take that challenge? Happy to try. Okay, cool. Let's give it a shot. So the first, a uh, uh, most common thing we hear is there's just so much chaos and I feel like there's critical details, opportunities, from money opportunities to sales opportunities to something I was supposed to do, whatever. I feel like there's so much falling through the cracks. And I got post-it notes. I tried software. The left hand's not talking to the right. Can't find. So that it's chaos. And the details are falling through. What would you, what would be your draft? This can fix it. Maybe give me like a foundationally, you got to work on building something that's going to happen over the period of years. But what would you do over the next, say, 30 days to get this in order so you, you can kind of triage it? Yeah, I think, you know, some of these things may seem fairly obvious, but they actually help me to this day because I still feel like that sometimes where it's overwhelming because I haven't sat down, wrote down everything that I'm now trying to be responsible for or, or get done and then rewrite it in an order of priority and draw a line, here's the things I'm not going to do. Like one of the hardest lessons I, I learned along the way is there's no way I'm getting everything done. But what's important is I've got to make sure that I'm going to get the things done that are going to move the needle and matter. And so you have to break it into those two buckets. And so I would say in the next 30 days, take all that huge list and break it into two buckets of this is the thing that's going to be healthy and move the needle for my company. And this is a thing that is problem today, but isn't necessarily crucial to my business going forward and try to put it in those buckets. And, and even just that exercise is going to help crystallize the priority in your mind a little bit. Okay. So just to restate it, write down what you're responsible for, and then look at your priorities. Maybe look at the top, break, maybe break them out into two buckets and then say, uh, this is gonna happen to move the needle now. This is the stuff that isn't as critical. I'm gonna put it aside maybe to the someday bucket and I can go back and reevaluate. Right, and, and that's hard because it all seems really important. And so, but you're gonna have to draw a line because you only have so much capacity. And, and so you have to get over the inertia of not wanting to draw that line. You have to. So I'm gonna throw this at you. I heard this quote recently. Someone said, you will not finish your work and you have to look at 75 to 80% of what's in front of you, recognize that that's an understatement and say no to it. And saying no doesn't mean it doesn't get done. Saying no says it either doesn't get done now, or if you can reasonably hand it off, it gets delegated. So what do you think of that? Do you think that's, that's exactly, I mean, that's much more eloquent than the way I put it, but that's exactly uh, what I'm talking about is you're fooling yourself if you think you're gonna do everything you think needs to be done. Yeah. And, and you've got to face reality on that sooner rather than later. And yes, it's not that those things don't ever happen. They just probably aren't going to be done by you. So one of the things that we've noticed, and tell me if you've seen this too, and, or what, if, you've, if this has been an issue, uh, maybe even for you in your company, saying yes to things you need to say no to, and then not being able to do what you said you were going to do. This happens a lot and it happens to this day. Um, and we talk about it in our management ranks a lot. And it's about keeping your commitments. 
And when you say yes to something and then you don't follow through on it, you've told somebody they're not important, right? Whoever you made the commitment to that you didn't keep, you've just demonstrated that they aren't important to you. It's a lot better to say no than it is to say yes and don't fulfill because of that. So you're eroding trust when you say yes and you don't do it. You're not, you're actually building trust when you say, no, I can't get to that. I can't do that. And again, it's hard because no seems people think you're not likable. No seems, you know, you're not interested. Well, I am, but I know that I can't get to it. And so uh, it's really for us and in, in, in our team, we spend a lot of time around this very issue and saying, if you can't do it, say you can't do it or say when you can do it. Don't make a commitment you're not going to keep. Yeah, I think that's huge. I, I found that to be a huge challenge, just a, a dynamic challenge as we've grown, especially when I, in the consulting space where I can see, wow, you could really get to this point. And then it's like, you know, this business owner has to take responsibility for resources, timing. Incidentally, when you look at team members and some of the top re- relationship problems they have, I mean, we, we hear regularly about, you know, problems at home or why people right. can't come in or can I deal with this? And we find out inevitably it's conflict avoidance. It's saying yes, so someone will be happy, but compounding the problem by still not dealing with it and not doing what you're saying you're going to do. And I think you just hit it on the head. People, you know, there's all these love languages and all that and all this promise making and under promise over deliver and all that. But I think it just comes down to it's the actions that speak louder than the words. And in time, no matter what you say, you've either built trust or eroded trust. Exactly. And look, we all do. I do it to this day. I find myself knee jerk agreeing to do something and then later going, why did I do that? And then I have to pick up the phone or go see the person I made the commitment to. And and I have to lay it out and say, you know what? I shouldn't have told you that. I'm not going to be able to keep that commitment. And I'm, I'm sorry that I, you know, told you I could. And I'm yeah. Because it's a lot easier to just say yes today and, and then move on. But it, like I said, I mean, it's, it's, it's important for all of our managers to make sure that they're building trust with the teams. Yeah. No, this is brilliant. This is brilliant stuff. It really digs up the important stuff. So we're going to move a little quicker on the next few items because if we got into that one was a fun one. And I think it hits a lot of points. So the other one is wondering if you're going to get paid. Now, the first thing that comes to mind for me that I've seen is people that don't set clear expectations at the beginning of a project and capture the before. This is what we said we're going to do. This is what you said you wanted. And getting into what I call documenting the future disagreement before it needs to be one. Wow. That's a great phrase. Um, (laughs) I think the way I think of it is every email you're writing, pretend that it's being read in a courtroom kind of a thing, but yours, I'd certainly like that. You know, I think this is probably a real challenge for a lot of the residential remodelers and and a lot of people get into a project and if you didn't spend enough time in the definition phase defining exactly what you were going to be doing and and what those you know what the that pricing was going to look like you can find yourself you know arguing over scopes and arguing over pricing and arguing over those things so that's why again the more time you spend up front defining all those things and setting expectations, as you just said, Nate, you're going to be way better off because you can just point to that planning document and go, we agreed to this before we, you know, went into execution phase. And so we, I don't understand why this has become a problem. If you haven't done that, now you're, you know, you're in a position where you're probably going to have to give a little to get where, you know, to get anything out of it. It's almost like you go back into the sales cycle if you didn't complete the process of setting the definition clearly. I think you, you again, you've said it is you're reselling the same project over and over throughout the execution and you don't want to find yourself there. So and, your solution think, is go ahead. time in the definition phase, get it right, get it communicated, even if it's difficult. And for us, because we don't really work in the, the single family realm, we do try to verify funds before we start, if at all possible, usually possible. Yeah. A little background check. Yep. A little background check and current life reality check. Yeah. yeah. That's a good idea. Actually, that's one I don't hear that often. That's a, that's a great insight. And it's not that hard to do. Like, hey, we'd love to work with you. We just need to know where the you know resources are going to come from. We're going to be taking money from our account, putting it into your results. Mm-hmm. And we just need to make sure there's money in your account, you know, that it's going into the same place. So that's good. Um, okay. The next big challenge then is so far, I think we're, we're two for two. Doesn't surprise me. 
Um, I don't think I'm going to stump you, Rich. <laughs> I already told you you're hired. We just haven't organized the detail. Okay. <laughs> right. uh, okay. So the business is running my life. And this goes back to the chaos concept, but the idea I'm losing, I'm, I'm gaining weight. I'm not healthy. I'm, I'm missing my kids' events. I'm stressed or thinking about the business all the time. I'm never really away. It's never shut off. All right. What's your triage and what's your long-term foundational piece? So, so a little background there first is, you know, I think the business, the business world is really changing on this front where I was a part of you know, living in the Pacific Northwest in the Microsoft Amazon heyday. And the expectation was if you weren't coming in on Saturday, don't bother coming in on Sunday kind of a thing. And so I think that's really changed. And, and for us, we want to recognize that we live to work, not work to live kind of thing. And that's hard for entrepreneurs, really, really, really hard for entrepreneurs. The simple thing to do is, you know, a little bit back to what we were talking before is, organize it, right? Think about what you're not going to do and think about what you need to do. I think as you're trying to grow and go up this curve though, now you've got to start identifying, do I need a layer of management between me and my teams? Okay. Because, you know, making that decision is a tough decision because it's overhead, right? It's, it's not going into generating revenue necessarily, but it's going into protecting profit, as I say, and think about it. So now start identifying what do you want your future organization structure to look like and just start making boxes on a piece of paper and fill them out. And again, once you start, you can continually refine it, but it's good to get your thoughts around that. Where do I need a manager or a foreman or you know a super or a PM or a senior PM who's not specific on any project, but managing a group of, of projects? And you know that's going to lead you to where okay, this is how I'm going to get where I need to go and continue to grow my company. And it seems like it, to that point, you're talking again, it seems like we keep going back to anticipation, having a forecast. Once I'm, you know, and I found we build confidence with our clients, we help them build confidence by, and, and I do it too. What's the, how's this going to pay me back? <laughs> right. How's this going to do a better job for the customers that we have? It's very, it's a big investment to get a customer. Yep. It's difficult to then lose that customer because I'm going to try to save money and not have a project manager or a manager. Right. And, and so when you find yourself being stretched that thin, right, you're now constrained. And so if you want to go to the next level, it's not a perfect step. It's, the curve is not perfectly linear, right? It steps. It goes in steps. And so you've got to make investment then you get return, then you make another investment and then you get a return. And so you've got to think about it that way. Uh, if you want to scale, um, that's what you're going to need to do. Because what you, what you said is true is losing a client is really, really difficult because they're hard to get. Yeah. So, so you don't want to make a mistake. You don't want to, you know, uh, step in it in, in your execution because of that, you want to make sure that you're still going flawless. So even if you make a little less money because you had to invest in some middle management, it's okay because you're going to maintain that client relationship. I love that. You know, I think about this idea of what you just said and, and uh, kind of want to underline it here, bold it, clear, the, the clarity that you invest first, then you get a return. It's like that lead and then lag activity. Do this thing, do this thing, keep doing this thing, keep doing this thing. Hey, look, there's a result. Did the lead activity that I'm doing need an adjustment to get a better result? Do I like the result? Now I can look at what worked and, and enhance that part. Does something need to stop? So I do have to make it a shift. Maybe it's not, you know, not working at all. And, you know, I look at it like when uh, we build a training, you know, as part of the consulting programs that I build and the coaching and mentoring programs, every one of them has a different purpose and a different rhythm. And people, you know, we see these posts all the time on these, these LinkedIn and Facebook posts and Google ads and all these people, these are experts are like, you know, go out this week and make, you know, make your million. But I, I know a number of people who've, you know, frankly, we've had clients who've done, you know, five, six, $800,000 in, you know, a week or two. Mm -hmm. But what they don't realize is the several months and for some of them, several years, before they got to go have that, you know, overnight success, the, the well drilling, the mistake making, the banging the head against the wall, the falling down and getting back up is go, 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 consistent routine, consistent routine. Uh oh, this is Monday and I'm still doing it. And then the return comes in. It's not all at the same time. No. And, and sometimes it comes 
further down the road than you'd like. And, and I had a, um, we, I raised venture capital in a, in a past life. And I asked the, uh, the principal at the venture capital company, what's the most important thing for you look for in, in an executive management team? And he, he said one word, perseverance perseverance. You're going to run through every bad thing you could possibly think of. And if you're able to get through all that and still go forward, you're going to succeed. And so that stuck with me for, for many years. And believe me, I'd love to say that, yeah, our curve has been super up and to the right, but it hasn't. <laughs> and I don't think anybody's really is. But if you get through all those things and continue to work at it, you'll find a way. It's pretty interesting when you start to see things win. I mean, even if I look at my last web training, I've done hundreds and hundreds of web trainings over the last 20 years. And I remember the first one and it's like grind, grind, grind. And all of a sudden I went three and a half hours in my first webinar. And I was like, I had this, gosh, first webinar that would have been maybe 2008. If I, if I go back to 2008, it's like, I did a webinar and everyone's like, you know, what's a webinar? <laughs> you just call it a WebEx, you know? And it's like, no, I ran ads to it. I went and spoke at an event. And what was really strange is, um, three and a half hours. I'm sweating. I'm scared. But people didn't realize I spoke at two or three other events, carrying a big PA system, having a team come down, setting up posters, doing you know JVs to have people go to an event where they were just coming to see me to learn my stuff, but they didn't even sign up or pay for anything. They were there for someone else. Mm -hmm. But then I did the webinar. I spoke on someone's page. We had um, 91 people sign up. Then 60 or so people showed up. 27 people stayed. 16 people were there in the last 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I went an hour over. Oh boy. But in the end, 12 people signed up for a $12,000 course. And yeah, I looked back over months of, I wonder if this is going to work. And it's like, just keep going, just really? keep going, just keep going. Now we go out, we do an event. It's like, hey guys, I, I have these teams that I build in different locations as we do the events. And I know we'll be talking more about the overflow for success like we talked about. You know, I love the idea of you sharing insights with more people. I just think I dig your, your point of view, but it's like the team's like, Hey, you know, there's, there's only a handful of tickets sold the events only three weeks away. It's like, Oh, <laughs> some of my most successful events is, you know, two to five days before the event. And then you start to see your first sales. Mm -hmm. And even then not everyone wins. No, you're, you're right. And I think that actually does apply to, um, you know, the, the restoration industry and, I've got a chief sales officer who I will go to her and say, okay, is it going okay? And, and she still is having to calm me down. Yeah, we're fine. We're going to be fine. We're, we're there. Don't worry about it. You know, and we've got, even with all our systems and our pipeline and our ability to kind of view and, and we know what our conversion rates are, even with all that, right? There's still something to this industry where you've got to always make the next sale right? There's just no annuity that keeps returning. And so once you understand that sales are going to happen, you can keep going forward. Just in, like in your example, hey, I know it's going to happen. We, we're good. we got this. In every cycle of students, some will go up to the next level, some will go away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so in addition to that, what I tell everyone and the listeners, I think will appreciate this is for every over just tragic failure in a launch in a new product, in a new team, a new department, a new division, a turnaround, just anticipate the collateral benefit that you're looking for in the relationships. You know, for, we found banking relationships, investor relationships, partner relationships, and always keep your eyes open for this or something better. The collateral benefit sometimes eclipses the original goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got clients who give us the, some that give us the most glowing reviews are the ones we really stepped in it on their project. But what we did next was really important, right? We made it right. And that's one of our, our core values uh, in our company is do what's right. If we made a mistake, make it right. And we all make mistakes, right? It, but it's what we do next that really defines us. I love that. That's a quotable. <laughs> I love that. All right. Well, we've covered so much. I think that, um, you know, we didn't hit every single point, but the ones that we did hit, we hit them right square between the eyes. We've gone longer. I think every second of this, this has just been a great interview. I'm glad, Rich, that you came back. Well, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. And, you know, I love talking about these things and, and realize that, that a lot of different folks are facing these same challenges. And I'd love to hear about others' challenges because it, it helps me learn, too, uh, what we need to be doing better and, and what we need to be doing next. So I really appreciate the opportunity. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, well, I appreciate the interview. Thanks again, uh, Rich, for being on the on the Minimal CEO podcast again. And I hope that you're after you know you're on here, you take the time to go back, not only download your episode, and I know you're going to be giving, you know, we're, we're going to be sharing it. You guys will be sharing it. And I think it's just really good stuff. I learned during this time we had together. So I appreciate uh, you taking the time to be on here. And I have a funny feeling you and I are going to be talking a lot more. Uh, I would love that. I learn uh, every step of the way as well, Nate. So thank you so much again. All right. So everyone, thanks again for coming on to the Minimal CEO podcast. Take take the moment, download an episode, make sure you take the time. It's always helpful during our podcast to think about how what we're doing applies to your business. And again, I'm Nate Lindquist. Uh, you know, I put this together, this podcast together, because I think every single service business, every business owner in general is going to run into challenges. We run into challenges, our guests run into challenges, and that's what allows us to see what's essential, what can we focus on, and really what can we cut away. It's not about junk food marketing. It's not about trying to do more or working harder. As a matter of fact, what I've learned, you know, from talking with so many successful people, not unlike Richard here, uh, I should say Rich, where, where I, I just... I see your name on there and I gave you, I used your full name, but Rich Witten here, you know, you've just said you learn a ton. I don't have a $125 million company that I'm running. So if there's a lot of humility in that. And I think we can all learn from what we cut away and learn from everyone that we're around. So download the podcast, share it, tell other people about it. If there's someone you'd love to see on the podcast, go to Facebook and by all means, put a comment in wherever you listen to your podcast and also go to Facebook to the minimalist CEO. Let us know what, you know, what you'd love to have on here. If you're interested in being on the podcast, or you know, someone who really is sort of representative of what you think would be someone who focuses on what's essential to build a helping system and help more people. This has been great. Uh, Rich, thanks again. Thank you. And uh, we'll be back again really soon. Thanks everyone.